Turn to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 16. Life is about, uh, life is about relationships. And um, life is a relationship. Everywhere you look in life, you have a relationship with someone. Uh, there are mother and father relationships, brother and sister relationships, friend relationships. There are a husband and wife relationships. There are co-worker relationships. And we don't mean anything evil or observed in those ways. But what I'm saying is life is built uh, around and in relationships. That's, that's what your whole life from birth to death will be about as long as you breathe. Building relationships with people. And um, if we're going to reach people, we have to build relationships with them. And what I mean by that is I've, I've been able to sit under a few pastors who, who were great relationship builders. They would go eat at the same place every morning and just to reach a few people that work there. They would go to the same tie shop or the same suit shop every day and deal with the same person just to build a relationship with that man or woman so that they could then have an open opportunity to give them the gospel. So there are many times that God is going to allow us to be able to give a gospel tract to a random person and they'll come to our doors and they'll get saved and we're able to build relationships in here. But many things that happen in life, God gives you the opportunity to build relationships in the world and then reach people through that. I think about as I was able to work in the bus ministry at Temple Baptist Church and Northside Baptist Church about how, uh, you know, the, the people we, that the real faithful writers were the ones that we built relationships, not only with them, but with their families. And uh, it was more than just, you're going to have a hit or miss rider when you just show up once in a while and knock on a door. But when you take time out of your day to go and spend time with them and show the parents you truly care about that child and you're in it more for than just for the numbers or for money or for anything else, well, once they see that you're building a relationship with them, they begin to trust you and then that opens up an opportunity to give the gospel. So nothing to do with tonight, but something the Lord put on my heart on the way here, just about building relationships with people. So let's continue to build uh, God-honoring relationships that way we have the opportunity to reach people with the gospel uh, here from Global Baptist Church. Exodus chapter 16. When we come to Exodus chapter 16, we'll do a little bit different than we normally do. Normally we read and pray, but uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a short background. But as we're studying the book of Exodus, it's the exit of God's people from Egypt, from that picture there of sin and Satan and enslaving. Uh, so God is leading His people out, and Exodus, the book of Exodus is the record of that. And what we find throughout the first 14 chapters is the many, many mighty miracles and wonders that God did to bring His people out and to allow, cause Pharaoh's heart to be eventually busted, I would say, hardened to the point where he just had to give it up to God and he let God's people go. And in chapter 15, what we find is we come off the Red Sea encounter where God split part of the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land and it closed up on all the Egyptian army and they died. But chapter 15 is a song uh, that Moses and the nation of Israel sang. And it talks about how great God is and how He's a God of their salvation. And He's their deliverer and their redeemer. And they're recognizing God as the one true God and they commit to serve Him and Him alone. But when we come to chapter uh, 15, actually I keep, we keep going back, but chapter 15, when we come to verse 22, uh, we'll find something interesting that happens immediately after uh, they begin to give God this praise and credit. Verse 22 of chapter 15 says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and went, they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And when they had come to Morah, they could not drink of the waters of Morah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Morah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Verse 25 and he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which he had cast into the waters. The waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and ordinance, and there he proved them. Tonight as we come to look at uh, this encounter, a few, a few different chapters about the nation Israel, uh, we're thinking about God's work, God's way. We're going to have three things uh, that God commands from us that if we're going to do His work, we must do it in 
His way. And God is a God of order, and God is very specific, and God is a God who expects things to, to run and us to operate as He sees fit and as He calls us to do. So it is important that as we move forward with God's work, that we're doing God's work God's way. And here when we come to the nation Israel, chapter 15, verse 22, we find that they've just come off praising the Lord and recognizing Him as the one true God, but now three days later they've come into this new place and they found no water. They were thirsty. Well, you can relate. If you weren't, didn't have any sweet tea or any water, or any juice or anything to drink for three days, you would be pretty thirsty too, and you would be doing your best to find out where in the world you could find water. But this stems far more than just a water problem. It turns into a faith problem, a faith, their lack of faith and belief in the Lord God to provide and take care for their needs. Let us go to the Lord God in prayer. Lord, we just ask that you would meet with us now. I ask that you'd help me, dear God, not to be scatterbrained, but help me to hone in exactly what you've given me, Lord. Help me to follow a, an outline, dear God, that you have given, you've breathed, Lord. I pray to God that you would just work in it. I pray that you would move it. I pray that you would just allow my thoughts to be clear, Lord, and allow the ears of the hearers, Lord, to be open and their hearts to be receptive of your word. I pray that you would help us, God, now as we study your word, help us to gain truth from it and help us to respond in the right way. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we come to verse 23, let's pick up back there again of chapter 15. And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Uh, the first thing we must see is that God's work it, it must be done God's way, and God's way is without murmurings. Number one, without murmurings murmurings. Uh, we, we're going to jump over to chapter 16 to pick up the next account. But notice whenever they came to this place and there was no water and these three days and they were thirsty and the water they came to actually found were bitter, they began to murmur or complain against Moses. Now remember that Moses was, was God's chosen leadership, was God's chosen man to lead the people out of Egypt. Remember how in chapter 3 and chapter 4, uh, how God came to Moses and spoke to Moses in the burning bush and God called him out among the people and God called him to himself. Well, you know, God calls us all out like the nation Israel. He calls us all out from a lifestyle of sin to serve Him, uh, to live in the land of Canaan. But God calls certain men and certain women to specific tasks that He has for their life. And God called, no doubt, Moses even beyond out of the nation Israel. God called out Moses to lead His people. And Moses found grace in the sight of the Lord. And what we find here is that the same principle is true today. Every Christian here tonight has been called out from the world, has been born into the family of God. But there are few in here who have been called to specific tasks. Uh, pastor Kyle, as you would call him, has been called to pastor the Global Baptist Church, right? He has. God has called him out to pastor. Uh, God has called me to preach His Word. God has called me out. That does not, not make us any better than you. But that means God has given us a specific task to lead as He did for Moses. And what we must understand tonight is as we're doing God's work, we must do it God's way. And number one, if we're going to do God's work God's way, we've got to do it without murmurings. Look at chapter 16, verse 1 with me, and let's pick up this biblical account. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, of the fifteenth day of the second month after the parting out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, understand what's happening here. God has just spoken and showed Himself with mighty signs and mighty wonders to the nation Israel. He showed them ten great plagues that He's used to bring His people out of Egypt. He's part of the Red Sea for them. Uh, he's been with them. He's provided for them already one time in chapter 15. He's provided water where He turned the, the bitter water into sweet water that they could drink. But now they come again and they have not learned their lesson. Uh, they began to murmur against Moses and Aaron 
barren together because they did not have the food that they desired. Now you would think by this time all the mighty signs and wonder that they had seen of God that this would be but a little thing that God could do. But that would not be the case because they murmured against the leadership that God had placed over them. Notice what it says in verse 3. It says, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. These people are so depraved in just a few days. Just a few days after they were on this mountaintop and this high of praising God and recognizing Him for all He had done to lead them out of Egypt, now they're wondering, is God even among us? Is God even with us? And I wonder how many times in our lives we come off of a mountaintop and boy, we just have a super spiritual service at church and one of the best messages we've ever heard and we're charged up and we make it through Monday, we make it through Tuesday and then we make it to Wednesday and we're the most defeated human being that ever walked through the door of the church Wednesday night because because we've let the world and circumstances determine our faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And no doubt this is where the nation of Israel was. They let their circumstances determine their faith in God and their faith in God's chosen men to lead them. At the end of verse 5 or verse 4 it says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every, every day, that I may Prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they shall bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt. And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that ye murmur against us? Now the first thing I want to draw your attention to is verse 4 said that I may prove them. And then later in verse 6... It said that ye, shall know, that ye shall know the Lord. You know, everything God does for us, everything that God does in this life, whether it be bad or good, things that happen in our life, He is doing that He may prove Himself to us. His doings are so that we may know Him in a greater way. You know, I think about many different occurrences in the Word of God, but we often see in Exodus the word prove, that God would prove to Him that He is the one true God, uh, that ye might believe or that ye might know me, right? That's, it's repeated a bunch of times in Exodus. But what about in the book of John? That all these things were written that ye may know and believe. What? You may know that ye have eternal life. Everything that God does and every, all the works that God, do, all the works that God do, do to in our life are works to help us to know that He is God. When you're going through a bad time, when you're going through hunger, when you're going through thirst spiritually or physically, well, you know what God's trying to do? He's trying to prove Himself to you. He's trying to bring you to the place, just like the nation Israel, where you must depend upon Him and you must have faith that He will provide for His children. Verse 7 said, And in the morning then shall ye see the glory of the Lord, for that He heareth your murmurings against the Lord... And what are we that ye murmur against us? Verse 8, And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against Him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And here's what I'm trying to tell you and lead you to in this first point, that we must do God's work, God's way, and that's without murmurings. Because when you murmur and when you complain at the dinner table, when you complain about the pastor and complain about the church and complain, complain about other members, and all you or your children ever do and all your grandchildren ever do and all your friends ever hear, hear you do and co-workers hear you do is complain about God's work and how God's work is being done and complain about God's leadership, then your complaint is not just against man, your complaint is against God. I've got it written down this way, complaints against man are a lack of faith towards God. You know what? Many times, just like these people, the Bible says they came to complain or murmur against Moses and Aaron. But Moses and Aaron fall on their face before God, and you know what they're saying? What does God say? He says, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. 
Uh, you know what you understand here? Is that your complaints against man and the leadership God has given is simply a lack of faith in God. A lack of faith that God would work in the leader's hearts. A lack of faith that God would lead Moses and Aaron the right way and lead the children of Israel down the right path. A lack of faith that God would provide even if it were by the hands of Moses and Aaron. So our murmuring simply declare not just that we disagree with man or that we're upset with a man or we're upset with a leader or we're upset with somebody in the church. Our murmurings declare that we have a lack of faith in God. May we be a people who don't murmur. Look at verse 9. And Moses spake unto Aaron, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. What's even greater than this is, you know, Moses and Aaron definitely heard the murmurings because they came to the Lord and approached Him about it. But what's even greater is, it, is that the Lord heard the murmurings of the people of Israel. You know, it's often said that, said that God hears and answers prayers. Well, you know what? God also hears your murmurings. And God knows your thoughts. And God knows the very intents of your heart. And God knows all about us. What we must understand is that God hears not just our praises, not just our acknowledgments, and not just our good deeds, but God hears and knows our murmurings. Verse 10 says, And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And this is God's point. This is God's, this is God's end for the people to trust and believe in Him. If we're going to do God's work, we must do it God's way. And number one, we must do it without murmurings. But number two, and we come to Exodus chapter 17 to find the second great point. Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1. And the word reads, "...and all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin..." after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Now here we go just a few days later, and they've moved now. They've, they've complained and murmured before Moses and Aaron. They've murmured and made their, their uh, requests known unto God uh, that they were not happy and they'd rather dwell in the land of Egypt than be here without water and die in this land. But now we come just a few days later into a new place, a journey into Rephidim, and you know what? The people here yet have no water again. Well, we would think, if we don't read any further, in our mind we would say, well, a few days earlier they probably learned from their mistake and they probably prayed and trusted in God and God provided. But that's not what happened. Look at verse 2. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is it that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Oh, can I tell you this morning that if we're going to do God's work, we must do it God's way. Number one, we must do it without murmurings. But number two, we must do it without tempting. We must do it without tempting. Because you, do you know what our murmuring is? It's a line of progression. When we begin to murmur, we begin to tempt. Were we tempting man? No. The Bible says here in verse, in verse 2, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord. Now this idea of tempt is not the idea of provoking God to do evil or tempting to sin. Many times we think of temptation, which this is a biblical definition of temptation, was like the temptation when uh, the, Satan the serpent came unto Eve and tempted her to go against what God commanded her to do. Now that's temptation, and you face temptation, and I face temptation daily, about things that we shouldn't do that the world wants us to do. That is at one end of temptation. Then we find the other end of tempting God. Uh, and what we find here is that they came unto God and they simply would not believe God. They tempted Him and said, God, are you among us or not? God, we don't know. And God's sitting back there like, what in the world? Why don't you believe me? After all I've done, after all the many signs, after all the many wonders, I have proved myself to you and you still tempt me and, and do not have faith and belief in my word that I've promised. 
What we find here is that we must do God's work God's way without tempting. Look there again with me at verse 4, and it says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. You know what began as a simple complaint about not having water came to a death threat. Came to them being ready to the point to walk away from everything God had done, to cross the Red Sea again even if they had to swim, and to go back and serve and be slaves in the nation of Egypt. You know, they come to the place where just one little murmuring or one little bit of complaining about not having something or something not being perfect or something not being right, they came to the place where they were ready to say, we're going to take God's leader, we're going to take the man of God who's held the rod of God, who has led us, and we're ready to stone him. We're ready to kill him. Let's get rid of him and let's go our own way. You don't think one little murmur or one little complaint can lead your heart to this point? You are wrong. We must do God's work God's way without murmurings and without tempting. Look at verse 5 with me. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Mer Meribah because the, of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now notice what God has done yet again. Even though they tempted Him, even they provoked, though they provoked Him to anger, even though they did not serve Him with joy, even though they did not follow after Him with true belief and faith in Him, you know what God did? God still provided for them. And He tells Moses to do something that none of us could go do today, to take a rod, to take a stick, to take something in our hands and to smite a great, smite a great rock, to hit the rock, and water would gush out of it. Well, can I tell you, it, this was more than just a little well springing of water that filled up a few buckets. There were over 600,000 people of the nation of Israel. And the Bible... Uh, indicates here that all those people, their thirst was filled. And then even beyond that, the cattle would have been fed or the cattle would have had their fill of water. This was a great mighty miracle of God and God provided. But you know why God did it? To prove Himself to the nation Israel. Because they would not believe Him at first, they would not believe Him at second, they would not believe Him at third and on and on and on. And God yet again shows them a great and mighty miracle that only He could do to prove Himself unto them. We must do God's work, God's way. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. We find that God's work must be done without murmurings. We find that God's work must be done without tempting. You know, I failed to mention this, but the opposite of murmuring is with joy. Now, we must serve the Lord with joy. With gladness. The opposite of tempting is simply belief. What does the Bible say in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know what God's design is for us? To have belief. To believe Him. God's desire has always been for His people to believe Him. For His leaders to believe Him. For the Christians, the child of God, to believe Him. But number three, we come to this great point in number, or Numbers chapter 20 and verse 1. And the Bible reads, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have you brought us up, brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die here? And wherefore have you made us to come out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates. Neither is there any water to drink. Now notice what the people are doing yet again in the book, in biblical account of Numbers. Now they've been led further. This is now a record of there, the wilderness wanderings. And what we find is that they were there because of their sin, right? 
Because they did not believe God, because they did not place faith in God, God calls them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and calls the older generation all to pass away, the fathers who would not believe God, until the younger generation will be brought up and God said, I will lead them into the promised land of Canaan. So, number one, the first thing we find here is that their accusation of, of Moses bringing, or of Aaron and Moses bringing them into this evil place, well, that was not Aaron and Moses' intention. It was their consequence, the reason they were in this place. It was because of their sin that they were not yet in the promised land. And what we find is that God was using the wilderness wanderings to bring the nation Israel unto Himself. And yet again, they come to a place and they find no water. And what do they do yet again? They murmur against Moses and Aaron. They chide with them. They tempt the Lord. And we're back in the same state we're always in. The same cycle of not believing that God can provide. Verse 6 says, And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So shalt thou give the congregation and their beast drink. Now notice the different commandment that God has given. We know we must do God's work, God's way. We know that we must do it without murmurings and without tempting. But notice God's commandment. Earlier in Exodus chapter 17, it was smite the rock. And now God says, speak to the rock. If you're going to speak, you're going to do it verbally. You're not going to do that physically. You're going to do that verbally. And God says, you know what? I know last time I told you to smite the rock, to hit it with force, but this time I'm going to perform the same miracle, but I just want you to speak to the rock. And let's find what, was, what happened. Verse 9, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. All right? Moses is on the right track. He's taken the rod of God just like the Word of God said. Verse 10, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Verse 11, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. If we're going to do God's work, we must do it God's way. Number one, without murmurings. Number two, without tempting. Number three, without comparing. Number three, without comparing. And what do I mean by this? Well, if we read verse 12, we're going to find a great consequence because Moses did not fully believe God. Moses did not fully follow God's commandment. Verse 12 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye not did the wrong thing, not because you uh, said the wrong words, not because you didn't do enough for the people of Israel, but Bible says, Because ye believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and He was sanctified in them. If we're going to do God's work, we've got to do it God's way. We must do it God's way. But you know what? We cannot do it without comparing. You know, in the back of Moses' mind, he began to compare with how God had worked before. And he said, well, if it worked the first time, it must be going to work again. And you know, in, in this life, many times we try to find the shortest and the easiest way to serve the Lord and the way that requires the least faith, right? Because if we're going to have faith, it's going to be faith in believing the unseen. Believing God for things that we can't provide. But Moses already knew that he had smoked the rock once and God had provided. So if he just did it again, God would bless again. Well, can I tell you what I've got written down here? There is not an equation. There is not an equation when serving the Lord. There is no this plus this plus this equals success. Can I tell you my favorite... As I was teaching fourth grade, my favorite subject to teach was math because there was no opinion about it. You don't have to have an opinion to get a math answer. Uh, you just have to know the equations. It's fact. Math is fact regardless of what people say. Two plus two is not five. Two plus two is four. It is fact. 
It is proven. There is no arguing math. And I love things like that because you don't have opinions, you don't have arguments, you just teach it, there it is, and you do it right or you do it wrong. If you do it right, you get the right answer. You do it wrong, you get the wrong answer. But when we come to serving the Lord, and when we come like Moses did to the rock and the commandment of God, there is no one way specifically that God commanded to do this thing. He didn't say every time you need water, go to the rock and smite it. No, God said go to the rock the first time and smite it and I'll bring about a miracle and go to the rock the second time and speak to it and I'll bring about the same kind of miracle. And what we find here is that Ultimately, it was the same result, right? Verse 12 says, uh, verse 12 says there in the end, uh, that therefore ye shall not... Verse, tw verse 11 says in the end, and the congregation drank and their beast also. Well, Moses didn't obey the Lord. He didn't follow the Lord's commandment. But you know what? The result was the same, wasn't it? Didn't the nation of Israel get provided for? Didn't they get water? Didn't their beast get water? Wasn't everybody's thirst uh, uh, filled or, or, or quenched? Well, here's the thing. They had the same result, but they had different consequences. Look there with verse 12 with me. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Boy, we had the same result. We had the same result of a mighty miracle of God, but we had different consequences. You know, sin or disobedience to God brings great consequences in our life. We saw it through the life of, of Jonah as we studied his disobedience to God, his running from God. Well, you know what? His sin brought consequences not to only to himself, but to all others around him. And so the sin of Moses and Aaron, you know what, would bring consequences to themselves. If we continue reading throughout chapter 20, we'd find that at that moment, uh, Moses and Aaron went up into a mount. And you know what? Aaron was killed. Aaron did not come back down out of the mount. And then later we find in the book of uh, Leviticus and then in De De Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy we find where Moses would die and would not see the promised land or not physically walk into the promised land. God would allow him to be able to stand up on a mountain, look over into it, but he would not be able to go and possess it and lead the people to the finished mark. You know, we have the same result, but we have different consequences. Success in God's work cannot be measured by the outcome. Success in the work of God. If we're trying to do God's work, God's way, we don't measure success by numbers. We don't measure success by the amount of money we've taken up. We don't measure success in God's work except by Christ-likeness. Except by growing closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think about Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. And I'm going to do, I'm going to do what, I, I, what I've learned to do and what is helpful for me, for me. And that's to sing it in the children's way, okay? This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Success in the Christian life, that verse, Joshua 1.8, does not promise that if we have big numbers, that if we do the right things, or if we make it look good, that we're going to have good success. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then... After you meditate and after you do according to God's Word and follow His Word and walk in His ways and love Him with all thy heart and with all thy soul and thy might, then thou shalt have good success. Success in the Christian life is not like the success we measure in the world. And what we find in the end is that we must do God's work God's way. And if we're going to do God's work God's way, we cannot do it with murmurings. We cannot do it with tempting, and we cannot do it, with, do it with comparing. So many times we want to compare to other churches or other ministries or the way other people are doing things. And we think they're successful because they got the biggest concert going on and they got the most exciting events and they got all these great things. I want to say so much more there, but uh, they've got all these great programs and great looking things going on. We've said, now that's a successful church. But success in God's eyes is different than success in the world's eyes. And what we must understand is we must do God's work God's way. We must do it without comparing. We must do it without comparing others to ourselves. But you know what? We must do it without comparing how God has worked with us and how God is working now. Uh, 
God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We know that. And God works in a familiar pattern. God will not do anything out contrary uh, to, to His person and to His character. But can I tell you, God doesn't always do the same things the same exact way. And He does that so that we can place faith in Him, so that we continue to grow. If we had, if we had the Christian life down to an equation, if we had church growth down to an equation, you know what? Boy, we'd be busting out the seams because uh, I love math and I'd have the equation figured out and I'd get it going. That's not how it is. If we want to grow a Sunday school class, there's no equation to that. It's called coming before God. Falling down as Moses and Aaron did on your face to God and begging and pleading with Him for God to move in school of the Bible or in Sunday school or in class or whatever it may be in your life. If we're going to do God's work, we must do God's way. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this message. Lord, I pray that You'd help us to serve You in a way that honors and pleases You. I pray, God, that You'd help us here, God, as individual Christians to serve You in our life and with our lives without murmurings, God, without tempting, without comparing. Help us to have faith in Thee and Thee alone. Lord, be with us as a church. Help us to move forward by faith, to trust in Thee, God, and to love Thee with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our soul, with every being of our body. Lord, help us to pray. Help us to fall on our faces before You. And God, help us to give our uh, pleas to You. Help us to see You work and move. Make Yourself known to us. Prove Yourself to us. Help us to move forward by faith. And it's in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. This